morning and welcome to Trinity English Lutheran Church on this first Sunday in Lent. We're so glad that you're with us. Our gospel lesson for today comes from the gospel according to St. Mark, the first chapter. In those days, Jesus came from Nazareth of Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. And just as he was coming up out of the water, he saw the heavens torn apart and the spirit descending like a dove on him. And a voice came from heaven, you are my son, the beloved, with you I am well pleased. And the spirit immediately drove him out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness 40 days, tempted by Satan. And he was with the wild beasts, and the angels waited on him. Now after John was arrested, Jesus came to Galilee, proclaiming the good news of God and saying, The time is fulfilled, and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe in the good news. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable to you, O God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Earlier this week, I was talking on FaceTime with a friend of mine, and we were sharing our shock that Lent is already upon us. I confessed that Lent somehow always manages to sneak up on me. I suspect I'm not alone in this. And we tried to create a last-minute slapdash plan for what Lenten practices we would take up this year, what we might give up and what we might add on to our daily routines, as is our Christian tradition throughout this season but nothing felt quite right. For example, we wondered about adding the daily discipline of sitting in silence for an extended time, but we were both discovering that we were doing more than enough of that living alone during this pandemic, and so on and so on. A silent moment passed as we considered our quandary before my friend smiled and suggested, maybe we should give up Lent for Lent. Of course, my friend was joking, but I think her suggestion speaks well to the strange situation we find ourselves in on this first Sunday in Lent. Who would have imagined as the coronavirus pandemic began that we would still find ourselves very much in its grip one year later? Who would have thought that we would be entering into this season of Lent after a year that's felt like one disaster after another, after a year of fires, flood, and hurricanes, a year when we were introduced to murder hornets? It's only been a year, but it feels like we've been wandering in the wilderness for a lot longer than that. But on this first Sunday of Lent, when we are more tired than ever of the wilderness and more anxious than ever to leave it, we learn from Mark that the Holy Spirit has different plans. Listen again to Mark's story of Jesus' temptation. And the Spirit immediately drove Jesus out into the wilderness. He was in the wilderness 40 days, tempted by Satan, and he was with the wild beasts, and the angels waited on him. That's it. That's all we get. It's startling to read it again, isn't it? To encounter anew the immediacy and urgency of Mark's story. Compared to its counterparts in Luke and Matthew, Mark's version of this narrative leaves a lot to be desired. We aren't privy to Jesus' conversations with Satan, nor are we given any particulars about these wild beasts and angels. There's no dramatic invitation for Jesus to prove himself by turning stones into bread or to gain all the power of the world by worshiping Satan or to confirm his identity by throwing himself from the temple and allowing angels to save him. Instead, we are simply told that the Spirit immediately drove Jesus out into the wilderness. The Greek here literally means that the Spirit violently threw Jesus out into the wilderness cast him out. Why does the Spirit do this? Jesus is still dripping wet from his baptism. He's practically still gasping for breath after his immersion in the Jordan River. Why does the Spirit drive Jesus out into the wilderness so suddenly? And on top of all this, this mysterious wilderness that the Holy Spirit throws Jesus into is a frightening place. 
a desert filled with hunger and thirst and exhaustion and temptation and wild beasts and angels, a wild place where Satan apparently resides. We've seen it before. We remember in Genesis when Abraham and Sarah throw Hagar out into the wilderness with her son Ishmael, offering her nothing but a loaf of bread and a skin of water for the journey leading her to become so hungry and thirsty and hopeless that she abandons her son Ishmael under a bush because she cannot bear to watch him die. We remember that the Israelites wandered in the wilderness for 40 years after the Exodus, hungry and thirsty and complaining and grieving and bickering among themselves and simply fighting for survival as they waited year after year after year to enter the land that God had promised them. We remember that David was forced to flee into the wilderness multiple times, running for his life first from King Saul and later from his power-hungry son, Absalom. We remember that even the great prophet Elijah was forced into the wilderness after Queen Jezebel threatened his life a wilderness so exhausting and disheartening that Elijah begged God for death. And we remember our own human family's experiences of wilderness in the past year. We remember our isolation and loneliness. We remember our Zoom fatigue. We remember those we love who have died, and we feel the grief and pain of their absence. We remember when we and our loved ones have been sick and injured. We remember the wildfires that tore across Australia and the West Coast. We remember Ahmaud Arbery and George Floyd and Breonna Taylor. We remember our Asian and Asian American siblings who continue to be targeted for hate crimes. We remember hundreds of our transgender siblings who were killed this past year, the deadliest year for transgender people on record. We remember the violence that has taken place here in our own city and around the country. We remember the insurrection at our capital just last month. We remember the baptisms and weddings and funerals and burials that have been delayed or that we were unable to attend because of coronavirus restrictions. We remember the vacations and family reunions we've canceled, the meals we've eaten alone, the Easter's and Thanksgiving's and Christmases and birthdays and ordinary days we've spent apart from those we love. Fear, isolation, hunger, thirst, despair, grief, suffering, loneliness, bitterness, exhaustion, death. This is what the wilderness holds for God's people. But it's not the end of the story. And the Spirit immediately drove Jesus out into the wilderness. God hears Hagar and Ishmael's cries and finds them in the wilderness, making a way for them where there was no way. Do not be afraid, God says, opening Hagar and Ishmael's eyes to a nearby well of water. And the Spirit immediately drove Jesus out into the wilderness. Even as the uncooperative and rebellious Israelites wander in the wilderness, God does not abandon them. As a pillar of fire and cloud, God accompanies God's people through all the sand and dust and sun, providing them with manna and quail to sustain them. And the Spirit immediately drove Jesus out into the wilderness. David cries out to God from the wilderness of Judah. O God, you are my God, he says. I seek you, my soul thirsts for you, my flesh faints for you, as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. And God finds David, even in this most barren place. My soul is satisfied as with a rich feast, David says, And my mouth praises you with joyful lips, for you have been my help, and in the shadow of your wings I sing for joy. And the Spirit immediately drove Jesus out into the wilderness. When Elijah cries out to God for death as he journeys through the wilderness, God finds him. 
offering Elijah a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water, God says, get up and eat. Otherwise, the journey will be too much for you. And the Spirit immediately drove Jesus out into the wilderness. Womanist theologian Dolores Williams reminds us that the wilderness, this place where we come face to face with fear and isolation and anger and hunger and thirst and suffering and despair and loneliness and bitterness and exhaustion and death, this is where we are most powerfully reminded of how much we need God, the place where we are most keenly aware of God's role in our survival. The wilderness, in other words, is where God finds God's people when we're at our very worst, where God sees us and sustains us and calls us forward step by step, where, as Letty Russell writes, we encounter a God who brings justice and healing to our world in crisis. And this morning, Mark invites us to see ourselves in this wilderness story. And the Spirit immediately drove Jesus out into the wilderness. Thanks be to God, because that means that even in this wilderness, we're not out of God's reach. It means that Jesus is in the wilderness with us. Now make no mistake, this reality isn't some sort of silver lining platitude or a free pass to ignore the pain in our lives and in our world in hopes that God will fix it all for us. We are in the muck of the wilderness, dear friends, and we remember in this Lenten season that we brought ourselves here. This is not a safe or fulfilling or healthy or good place for us or for our neighbors. And God doesn't offer us a golden ticket escape from it all. Instead, God invites us to participate in the healing, redemptive, restorative work of justice and peace that God is already doing in the wilderness. And thanks be to God, the Holy Spirit has thrown Jesus into the wilderness to be in the muck with us, too. So maybe my friend was on to something when she suggested that we give up Lent for Lent this year. After all, we're already in the wilderness of Lent, We've been here for a year now, and even though there's a light at the end of the tunnel, we know that we're not out of it yet. So maybe our call for this Lent isn't necessarily to enter into the wilderness, but to renew our commitment to really living in the wilderness with and for our neighbors, to resist the temptation to look away and get comfortable, and to join in the work of justice and peace that God is doing among us. Our Lent guidebook offers some suggestions for how to enter into this Lenten discipline this week, like ditching the list, taking some time outside of our usual routines to rest in and remember our need for God's presence, or simple eating as a way to remember our neighbors who experience hunger. We invite you to join us this week in these Lenten practices and the others in our guidebook as we continue our journey through the wilderness together. And the Spirit immediately drove Jesus out into the wilderness. The wilderness is indeed where we find ourselves this morning, but it's also where the triune God finds us. Thanks be to God. Amen. Once again, welcome to worship at Trinity English Lutheran Church. We are so glad that you've joined us on this first Sunday in Lent, and we pray that our worship will be a blessing to you as we prepare for the week ahead. We want to be sure to let you know this morning about a new opportunity for fellowship and conversation here in the life of our church, and that is the Trinity English Book Group. We are gathering on the third Monday of each month on Zoom throughout this winter and spring season to explore the question, what does the secular have to do with the sacred? Each month we read and discuss a different novel. Our next gathering will be on Monday, March 15th, when we will be discussing Maya Angelou's I Know Why the Caged Bird Sings. All are welcome, and we hope you will join us. To learn more, you can email me at hhawkinson at trinityenglish.org, or you can call the front desk. 
And as always, you can learn more about all that's going on in the life of our church by visiting our website, trinityenglish.org. God's peace be with you today and throughout this Lenten season. We continue in our worship with the prayers. And now let us pray. Lord Jesus, we give you thanks for the remembrance of your time in the wilderness, the remembrance of how you were with the wild beasts, how you were in the presence of the evil one even. We give you thanks for, the, for this remembrance because it gives us hope that even as we are in the wild places now, that we are not there alone, that you've gone there before us, that your presence lingers there waiting for us and to accompany us through those places. Send your Spirit to us in these days. Allow us to know your presence and give us your peace that as we navigate those wild places, that we know that your presence is among us, that you give us strength for the journey, and that you allow us to be your people even while we are there. In the midst of all of the wildernesses that we have felt over this past year, we, we pray for your grace and your peace. We pray that you would forgive us those times when we have been impatient, when we have been impertinent towards one another, when we have been forgetful, when we have been self-centered, when we have wished for nothing other than for all of this to go away, and that, that somehow we could be exempted even when others weren't. By your Spirit, give us strength for this journey and the ability to show your presence by our very presence for our friends and our neighbors and our community and our world. In the midst of turmoil and disruption, we pray that you would allow us to be present in our community, knowing that our community depends upon us, that our community is a gathering and collection of all of us together. Give us hearts and minds that are able to see beyond our own individual selves into the hearts and minds of all of those who are around us. Give us your spirit that we could act as you would act to be present for all of those who are in this world. We pray for all of those who are in positions of authority, those who are in government, the president, the Congress, and all who judge and administer the laws for our own governor, for our own mayor, and all of those who are in positions of authority that have been elected or appointed in our places of life and work, that they would be instruments of your peace and your guidance and your reconciliation in this community. We remember especially all of those who are dear to us, those who we remember in this day, those who are in need of your grace, your healing touch, your, your presence for peace, especially those who ever asked for our prayers, including Anne and Sharon, Barry, Dorothy, Dewey, Mara, Heath, Adderley, Ava, Kira, Char, Mary, Bill, Maria, Judy, the Query family, Beth and Elaine, Leo and Shirley, Charles and Nicole. Give them your grace and your strength for the times that are ahead of them. Guard us in this week. Allow us to feel your presence, knowing that in those moments when we may sense that we're alone, to know that we really aren't, that your Spirit guides and helps and directs us now and in all of the days yet to come. And now, Lord Jesus, we hold and give to you all of those things which are on our hearts and our minds, granting that you would give us peace and strength for the days that are ahead. Through your name we pray. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor this week and in the days to come in grace and peace. In the name of our Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.